calling all nerds. Hey, get over here. He's calling all nerds. Oh, jeez. Here come the nerds. It's time to talk to the interested and interesting. I was wondering when the nerd would come. And here's your host, Mike Thayer. Hello, hello. It is me, Kyle, here to talk to you about podcast. Yes? Talk to interested and interesting. All right, episode four. Here we are. I uh, did not originally plan on doing this podcast. I had a different uh, conversation and podcast slated for episode four. But in looking at the date, I decided to do a bit of a special podcast. So episode four is about finding strength in loss. Uh, it is October 17th, as I said. It is one year to the day that I lost my father to liver cancer. And my dad dying is what kicked off this whole thing. And when I say this whole thing, I mean this whole new change in the direction of my life. Uh, Quitting my job, starting the podcast, writing full-time, pursuing all these different things that I've always wanted to do and dedicate my entire time to doing, all my creativity to doing, Um, It all started with my dad dying on October 17th, 2017. And so I wanted to talk to my brother, uh, Captain Dr. Steve Thayer, yet again, about finding strength in loss. So we talk a little bit about my dad, uh, our dad, and kind of how that affected me versus how that affects Steve. It affected us very differently and why we think that was. And then... We kind of step back and have more of a general conversation about about loss, about reinventing oneself, finding strength in loss, changing paradigms, changing changing your mind, your mindset. What sort of walls do we put up uh, in our lives? Whether it's uh, certain fears that we have or certain biases, certain biases that we have. Anyway, it turned out to be a really interesting conversation with my brother. So hopefully you enjoy it. It's about an hour long, so it's a little bit shorter than some of the other conversations. But I still think we get into quite a few interesting things. And as I kind of reflect, obviously I haven't been doing this for a year. I've only been doing it for for a few weeks. But it has been a year since since I lost my dad and since sort of everything changed. Uh, The whole context of my life and the decisions I was making changed radically in a day. So um, anyway, we explore that quite a bit. Hopefully you'll find this very interesting. Even if you don't know who I was or who my father was or who my brother is, I think you can still find... A lot of benefit from this conversation and hopefully uh, it'll be something that you can apply in, in sort of your life if you're looking to change your mindset looking to take your life in a different direction or uh, maybe you're not doing that and this will spark a little bit of uh, internal thought internal dialogue and uh, maybe taking inventory in your own life so without further ado here's my conversation with captain dr stephen thayer All right. Welcome, Captain Dr. Stephen Thayer. Welcome back. The first returning guest to Calling All Nerds <laughs> that there ever was. Um, this Good week morning. we are talking about finding strength in loss. It's sort of a special episode. It will air on October 17th, which is the one year... I hate to use the word anniversary. It kind of, kind of sounds like it's a happy thing, but it's uh, the one year anniversary since Dad died. And that's the whole thing that kind of kicked off this whole endeavor of mine. This quit your job, follow your dream, kind of change what you're doing, reevaluate your life. It all started with dad dying. So I thought it would be a pretty sort of apropos to talk about dad's loss and then just in general more broadly, because I touched on it in different episodes. Um, obviously, it's going to sneak its way into almost everything I do. Um, but talk more broadly about finding strength and loss and just rebuilding yourself and repurposing yourself. Um A recent conversation I had with my buddy, Michael Hill. So this is actually going to be a podcast that will probably be the week after this one. Um, But I talked about, it was like dieting, right? So we talked about like going on ketosis and intermittent fasting. And he had like, he had fasted for like seven days. (laughs) It's crazy. I didn't think it was possible. Anyway, we'll talk talk about it that that next week. But Jill had read this book and went to this um, like book club. And it was um, on intermittent fasting. And she'd come back. Before she went to the book club, she read the book. She's like, this thing's crazy. It talks about like fasting for seven days. I was like, that's impossible. And then she comes back from the book club. She's like, "Uh, Michael Hill down the street just did it. 
I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah, I just fasted for seven days. I was like, no way. So, um, and so we talk a little bit about kind of this mindset change, right? Like when you don't think something's possible and you get sort of in this rut, not necessarily in a rut, but you just get in this mindset that this is the way things are and you continue to go on things. And then someone shows you a different way of doing things. You're like, what the heck? Holy cow, this yeah. thing's actually possible. And this isn't some guy, you know, on the other side of the world. This is a guy down the street. This is my friend. So dad's, dad's loss was kind of the catalyst in me, in me kind of rethinking and recontextualizing my life in general. Which is weird because dad's teachings brought me to where I was, right? It was like, right. get a degree, get with the most stable company on planet Earth. Because when you're born in the Great Depression, that's the most important thing. Right. The most important thing is getting a job, holding on to that job for 54 years like Dad did. So it was weird that Dad's passing allowed me to like rethink some of that formula in a way. Um, but it did, and it's just this weird. I just I it's it's I don't know. A lot of people lose loved ones and they don't go through this huge existential crisis like I did, but like. I just looked at life completely different. It was so weird. Mm. It really was like the context of the rest of my life just changed like that. And it wasn't even like thinking about his impending loss was doing it. It wasn't until he was gone that like this part of me just like, I don't know. And then I started rethinking things. Well, it's like it was a huge paradigm shift for you. And I was thinking about it and it wasn't, you know, I, I, it wasn't a big paradigm shift for me. I mean, it was it, having dad die was difficult, of course, and my life was different afterward. But um, in the Air Force, we had this thing called the Swiss cheese model where yeah. we talk about aircraft mishaps and how. Yeah, that's when you use the same thing in engineering. Right. right? So yeah, all those things have to align of, and then you shoot something all the way through. Yep. Yeah. So there's for the listeners, right? There's a to have something like a sentinel event, or in, in the Air Force's case, an aircraft mishap. A lot of things have to have to happen in congruence in order for it to happen. Right. Because there's so many safeguards in place, so many ways to prevent an aircraft mishap that each layer of cheese represents one of those variables. And it's every once in a while you'll get all those layers lined up in a specific way that the holes line up, or one of the sets of holes lines up, and you can slip all pass the way a bullet all the way through. Right, engineering, we have like, there's engineering type barriers you put in there, right? You design a vessel so that it can handle overpressure. And then there's administrative controls. You And then all the way down to like your protective equipment. And there's culture. And there's all these different kinds of layers. So you're not just like, we engineered this thing to the max. Well, then you end up with a Titanic. Because you think it's engineered for what it's supposed to be, and it's not, right? And so, yeah, anyway, go on. Yeah, so for you, I think... You know, the paradigm shift was made possible because all these layers lined up and timing is important too, right? Timing right, is yep, hugely important. So you have your whole Chateau Deef thing going yep. on where, you know, you, you follow the path that that, uh, that dad sort of laid, you know, or at least his influence had laid out for you. And then his passing, it kind of liberated you, like it freed you up. Yeah, it was this weird, like, it's this weird duality, and I've thought about this a lot, where it was, I've talked about this before, like, um, a way that I felt very connected to Dad was through writing, even though it's not something I do with him, it's something that I do similar to him, right? I share it with him, although I don't do it with him. I've never right. written with Dad, right? <laughs> He's hardly read any of my stuff, or he hardly was able, you know, had a chance to read it, but I still felt like it, this is a way I was connecting with him in a way. So to really follow this, I was like, to follow this way, this sort of, this thing that I shared with dad, I had to give up basically all this other advice that dad had given me, which was go get a degree, stay in your job, you know, don't take any risks, be conservative, which served me so well up into a certain point. And it's like, now I have a chance to follow a different part of his advice that I couldn't, it's like, it's like the whole Adam and Eve thing. It's like, you know, don't eat from the tree of good and evil, but multiply and replenish. It's like, you, well, yeah. you gotta do one. I mean, you, you gotta transgress one to do the other. And so it's almost like with dad passing, it was like, oh, all right. So now his advice got me to a certain point. 
And I'm glad I got me to that point. And I wouldn't trade anything. If I was to do my life over again, I would do the same 10 years, right? I would go to get chemical engineering degree. I would get that base. I would make that money. Uh, I would have that kind of world experience and, you know, lived in two different continents, worked in five different continents, like all this stuff, which was great. Right. Um, but yeah, his passing really did. It was like it opened me up to be able to say, all right, now I'm going to follow my dream, which is kind of what dad did in a way. I mean, I don't, I don't really had like a really heart to heart dad with like, what were his dreams, but I know he loved writing. Yeah. Um, anyway, I mean, loved writing, loved fishing. He wasn't flashy about his dreams, I think. He always lament, you know, oh, if, sorry, Mike, I didn't have a million dollars, but do you think, what, what, what would dad have done with a million dollars? He couldn't even hang on to that, the brand new car he bought, the CRV. Right. He sold it almost immediately and bought some old Ford Ranger. Like, I, I don't think dad wouldn't even know what to do with a million dollars. He talked no. about it, but I don't, you know, so like, Simple fare for simple folk. Right? <laughs> I think it's true. So I looked at that and I was like, I don't know. Again, I could be wrong. Maybe he's got these like, you know, dreams he never lived out and he regretted it. But I didn't, I didn't pick up on that if he did. So it was this weird thing. It allowed me to sort of explore this other part of like, I'm going to pursue what I'm passionate about. I'm going to pursue storytelling like dad did. I'm not a similar kind of writer than dad is by any means. Um, but... I don't know, like in talking with him right towards the end, he, he told me like he got into writing when he was like 26. That's when he kind of was like, I'm going to start writing. And that was almost the exact same age I was. And obviously I'm taking a very, very different path than he did. But um, yeah, it's this weird way of like, I'm allowed to connect with that. But I never, it's almost like, I, I don't think I ever would have taken the jump or the plunge when dad was still alive. I don't know why they would stop me, but I guess it, it just, I don't know. Why do you think that would have stopped you? Like, just worried about him being worried about you not doing. I mean, the I could have. I could. It's not like Dad was coming out to visit me. I could have been living in Switzerland as long as I'm coming home every once in a while and calling Dad. He would have known. I mean, I could have right. kept it from him for sure. Um, not that I would have want to. Um, I just don't think my brain went there. That's what I'm saying. It's this weird thing that, like, the crude example I give. Um, and I've probably given this to you before uh, with quitting is it's a lot like a Mormon wedding night. Have I told you this analogy? <laughs> no, I don't think <laughs> I so. about it. Like you could not, before I got married, it was like, you know, consummating the relationship was an impossibility, right? right? I had built up, I was raised a certain way. I had certain this, moral this system. Psychic barrier, yeah. Impossible. It could not have happened. And then you got married and you're like, Oh, nothing was really standing in my way. That was pretty easy, you know? <laughs> and it's the same thing with quitting. You're like, I'm on the other side of it. And I was like, all I needed to say was two words. I'm done. That's it. But it was an impossibility. You know, I just, there's, you just, I just didn't, I didn't do those kind of things. Just mm -hmm. like I didn't, you know, I didn't fool around with young women. I just didn't do that kind of stuff. I was raised differently. I had different moral structure. And then... Um, yeah, so I don't know. Then the, the analogy gets kind of weird with that's passing and everything else, but like that's as far <laughs> as I want to take the analogy. But I think it's, I think it's an apt analogy. At least the, it, the, my mindset change was, was very similar. Looking back, I was like, no, nah, it was easy, but I don't know. I don't know why it was so dad sticking around. Um, kind of ended up in me sticking around with my job. Kind of makes you wonder what other sort of invisible barriers Tons. that you have in your head. And that's what I'm I'm loving having these discussions with people. I'm like, and I'm reading this book. The, I read this book, The Fighter's Mind. Oh, mm -hmm. so cool. This guy goes around and talks to all these different wrestlers and UFC fighters and boxers and and talk a lot about the psyche behind a fighter. And it's different than sports psychology because fighting is completely different than like basketball. There's similarities right. for sure, but it's a different it's a different beast. And now that I'm in the process of reinventing myself, I like thinking about these things. I like thinking about like, oh, because the one of the things that I talked with Michael Hill about the intermittent fasting, he's like, we're conditioned. It's a weird thing to say, but like we're conditioned to want three meals a day. Yeah. And if you skip a meal, you're supposed to be angry. He says, mm -hmm. because we watch Snickers commercials, you're supposed to be angry. <laughs> right? And he's like, but when you skip a meal and you're into something you really like, you're not mad. Think of when you got really into a video game and you skipped a meal. You're not like, ooh, like bemoaning your life. You're like, all right. 
It's not that big of a deal to go a whole day without food. It really isn't. Right. We're just, and so it's funny to think like, society has conditioned us to want three meals a day. I'm going to stick it to the man. Like, but in a way, they kind of have. No, they really have. We just have all of these crazy mental... And I'm not going to go like off and be some like yoga Zen master, like break down all the barriers. But I am interested in like, what are all the other barriers I put up? Mm-hmm. And you're, there's, success, mm-hmm. there's success in barriers, right? Barriers serve me extremely well. Yeah. Yeah, the routines. I mean, routine. Having a routine and a habit and habits are incredibly important. Psychic barriers. Yeah, but it's like it's like a barrier that allows you to focus. So I think if you set them up correctly mm-hmm. and know what their limitations are, I think they are vital in success. Like right. my barrier was through college was you're never backing down. Any class I took, I never quit. For, I never dropped. Mm-hmm. I remember I got into the class, the weed out class for for philosophy majors i somehow accidentally signed up for or whatever it was jeffrey r holland's son <laughs> and i was the only pre-missionary and the only non-psychology major chemical engineering gr- non- guy in there philosophy major yeah or what did i say psychology, psychology. Oh. non-philosophy major and i remember him going on and on and on about how this is the weed out class for philosophy majors and everything and i was like nah, all right we'll give it a shot and by the end they were calling me the philosopher king <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah. I just didn't back. It just wasn't in my brain. I just didn't quit from stuff. Mm-hmm. And because uh, it was quitting. Right. And now it's like I'm moving What's on. What's weird though, I don't, I don't feel like our parents ever gave us lectures about not quitting things. No, they didn't. No, I don't. I but, don't remember getting that. But all, almost all of us are like that. Yeah. We have a very high. Uh, what do I want to call it? I was going to call it durability. It's um, Resilience, tolerance. tolerance. We have a very, very high tolerance. I call it like a high tolerance for uh, corporate punishment. Like Paul and James are just like, especially Paul is a corporate ox. Just right. throw it on his big old freaking gnarly shoulders and just have him trudge on forward. You can put anything on that guy. And it serves us super well, man. We get through all sorts of stuff, but eventually, every once in a while, you stop. Like my motto, and I would tell myself this: "Don't look back, don't look, don't look. Sorry, don't look back, don't look down." That was my motto. Yeah. And it's like, don't stop, just keep going. Don't look back. Don't trust the path you're on, until I realized, ah, I'm not sure I'm on the right path anymore. And I didn't have that. I didn't even question that until Dad died. And then for some reason. I told you, and, I, and I've told this story before. I've told it in videos and whatever else. When I sat down and looked at the clock, you know, right. in the church, and that really was one of those crazy, like, epiphany-style moments where you just recontextualize your whole life, or at least not your whole life. You recontextualize your next step. There you go. Right. And um, yeah, and so I just said, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I need to do this anymore. And how cool would that be if I did something else? How awesome would that be if I did something else? And you can. Yeah. Right. And that's that's the paradigm shift I'm talk I was talking about. Then the that the fact that you can, the Mormon wedding night, like you you could have had sex before marriage. Right. If you want I mean, but in, in your mind it was like well, no, you just don't. You don't do it's that. It's almost as if you can't do that. And this like, is not this is not a PSA for not being chased. By the way, this for is just <laughs> lack thereof. Yeah, but like, yeah, uh, so much so that it just did not does not even occur to you. Nope. And there are a lot of things. As I said, it just kind of makes you wonder how many more things are like that in your head. Not that you're going to re-question all your morals necessarily, but the 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 goals that you have. Yep. The limitations you think you have. Human brains are really good at developing habits. You know, we, we used to have the cognitive psychologists have this phrase called that human human minds are we're cognitive misers. We like to conserve energy. Right. And one way we conserve energy is developing efficient subroutines, you know, mental habits. Right. And sometimes they can work for us, but often they work against us. Yeah, I like tell the, uh, in fact I told the youth today in church. I talk, I've told this at Exxon, all over the place, about how our, why we like stories, why our brains like existing narratives. And because we're trying to be efficient, our brain has existed. If we can, if we can cram something into an existing narrative, we don't have to think about it anymore. 
mm-hmm. and then we can move on. And part of it's like our brains being lazy, but part of that laziness is efficiency. If I don't have to think about something any more than I need to, I can move on to something more important or something more interesting, right? And the example I kind of use, it's a weird one, um, but it's uh, it's Brian Atkinson. So I, you know, he passed away and originally, because I know he'd gotten into some, you know, drugs and whatever else. And so it was very easy when you first hear something like that, you know, someone you played football with, I didn't know him all that well, but you know, our age, you know, mm-hmm. got kids or whatever. And it's very easy for me to move past that. If I can just assign an existing narrative to like, Oh, he was into bad stuff, whether it be right. drugs or whatever. And it's like, play stupid games, win stupid prizes, buddy. Right. Assigned it, moved on. Don't have to think about it anymore. And then I'd heard he'd kind of cleaned up. I don't know what the, what the story was, but I heard he kind of cleaned up in the end and it was, I don't know. I might have the story wrong, but um, it was it wasn't as cut and dry as that, right? It wasn't right. just like and so then it's like, oh geez, well if that can happen to him. Well, you know, if it was a car accident or if it was some you know medical condition or something, then I got to yeah. think about that. Then I got to think like, oh man, that could happen to me. What happened to my kids? What happened mm-hmm. if I got a car accident? I could you know I could have cancer like Dad did, and then you've got to wrestle with it, and then you've got to come up with another narrative where your life makes sense before you can move forward. Mm-hmm. And so you have to kind of, and sometimes some things really jostle you, like dad's death really jostled a lot of my internal narrative. So like, how do I move forward and have this make sense still? Um, uh, whereas before, all my narratives were kind of set and I was okay. Right. Um, but when things happen and your brain has to struggle with it, because I didn't have an existing narrative for losing somebody. Mm-hmm. We haven't lost anybody, really. I mean, grandparents, we didn't really, I mean, you know, we weren't that close with their grandparents. Some people are very, very close. Like my kids will be, you know, very, very close to Mimi and Ken and Jane and everybody. Right. And uh, so I didn't really have a narrative to deal with that, I guess. Mm-hmm. And especially since his dad, and I've taken a lot of cues off of dad in some form or fashion. So anyway, that's, I talk a lot about that, a lot about like, you know, realize biases are actually your brain in some respects, it can be a sign of your brain being efficient. Because all bias is an existing narrative. Now, if the biases are, what you need to realize is a bias can can mask what the real issue is. Just realize that's the downfall. I don't really right. think you have to eliminate biases. Because then you're, you can't think about enough stuff in the day. Or you can't think, en- en- you can't think about everything in the day enough to give it its due worth, Right. Like right. you're walking across the street, there's some guy that kind of looks like a thug, you got your kid and you're like, eh, I'm gonna cross the street. Yeah, that's a bias, of course it is. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna risk that. You know, he could just be a totally normal kid and be happy and super friendly. It's like, okay, maybe. But you know, biases are based off of something, based off of some pattern that you perceived or some, you know, previous experiences or whatever. And you go, Well, I've seen this before, I know how this plays out. Insert bias, you don't have to think about it, boom, and you use it for survival. Yeah, that's the adaptive use of them. And then, the you know, this, like I was saying before, they, they're double-edged swords because yep. at their worst, they're prejudices or they are stereotypes, negative stereotypes. And that can be unhelpful socially, but it can also be unhelpful internally. Yeah. If you have a, a mental prejudice toward, like against failure, for example – you don't, you really don't like to fail. And so you develop all these, these habits of thought and habits of habits of behavior and habits of emotion that are designed to protect you from failure because you have this core idea in your psyche that failure is bad. bad. So I got to avoid it at all costs. Yeah, that's a good one. Cause, and, and again, so then the question is, where are all of these? I'm not really looking, as I said, to eliminate bias from my life i'm looking to identify it and then right. evaluate it but i'm in the i'm in the process of reinventing myself sure well, let's you know put everything on the table and look at it again because mm-hmm. i don't think you don't go through these self inventories very often because you don't need to it'd be too you wouldn't accomplish anything because you're just evaluating you right eventually right. you got to be like all right this is where i'm at this is how the world works or the way i make sense of it and then i'm going to march forward and get something accomplished, and then something comes that like demolishes a bunch of that, or a piece of that, or all of that, and you have to like put it back all on the table, 
create another narrative and another set of biases and understandings. You can march forward with life and actually accomplish something. And I guess that was it with, with that. And I said, I think timing was a lot of it. I was unhappy generally in my career, but I was tolerating it, uh, especially with my recent assignment. And then really wanted to go out to the dream. As we've talked about before, some people, you know, their curse is not being able to follow their dream. Some people's curse is not knowing their dream. So I kind of had all of this swimming mm-hmm. around and then it just kind of came together at the right moment. But, um, but yeah, yeah. Bias is an interesting thing. Cause you can, you know, what the example I use in engineering is like, you know, Oh, all material from China is garbage. And look, there's a lot of shady stuff that goes on from getting material from China. Like, mm-hmm. but then again, I've gotten crappy material from anywhere. Got it from the U S I've got it from Europe. I've gotten it from, I mean, I didn't say lack of quality is no respecter of nations. That said, if you look at like who forges quality certificates and everything, a lot of that's coming out of China. And, right. but what you can say is like, you know, a piece of equipment shows up, it's got some problem, uh, friggin' China. And you just assign it to the existing narrative, existing narrative and move on. Mm-hmm. That could be the answer, but that, that could also mask what the really, what the real problem is. Right. And then in engineering, you do all these root cause analysis analyses and you dive into this stuff and there's, you know, you get all sorts of people doing this stuff and, and doing these investigations and then you try to figure out what the real root cause is. But sometimes you don't have time for that. Slap a bias on that bad boy and move on. Yep. So I just would like to know what they are. Again, I'm not going to eliminate them. I don't think people should. And anyone says, I'm free of bias. That's just bull. That's just not no, true. It's, yeah, that's it's not, not the way true at all. Brains work. It's not the way the brain works. If you if you like, I'm, I'm free of bias, I'd say you're pretty dumb. Mm-hmm. Your brain doesn't figure anything it's, out then. In fact, there's there's a there's a really good podcast called "You Are Not So Smart." He also has a couple of books where it just talks about a lot of this the cognitive biases that human beings are are vulnerable to. Right. And I just want to be aware of them. I just want to know kind of where they're at. It's like it's like when someone reads my book. I just want like beta readers right now, right? So I just sent my book off to beta readers. Um, already gotten a little bit of feedback on some of the original stuff. I just want to know. I'm not necessarily going to make a change. Mm-hmm. If enough people kind of come back to me like, yeah, you might want to make a change, then I'm like, ah, that might be onto something there. But if someone points something out and they're like, yeah, this is what I think, I could be like, cool. Okay. Yeah, another, another thing that something like dad's, like the death of a parent, the death of somebody that really matters to you, is it... Um, it allows you to examine the biases of an older self of like the self because you're a different man now than you were when you were 25. Absolutely. Definitely a different man yeah. when, when you were 18 and making a decision about what your major is going to be. Right. So to expect you to, to continue to toe the line in the service of your 18 year old, the 18 year old version of you is, I don't think it's, it's, it's totally useful. Yeah, I think and just pausing again, you might not make a different decision, but just pausing to reevaluate it, I think, is important. Yeah, to examine the underlying assumptions. Yeah, do they still doing. hold? I mean, you should do this, right? And that's why, like, I mean, flip flopping politicians is one thing because I think they do it; it's self serving. But if someone truly has like a change in opinion or heart or whatever, like. They should reserve the right to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, if anything, that shows that they're critical thinkers. Right. Now, I think that gets, as I said, so I think I think a lot of what you see, at least in politics, is it's, it's flip-flopping because it's self-serving. It's not really, they just, whatever they need to say, they'll say to get whatever they need to get. But, right. you know, there's plenty of people who's, you know, I always kind of go back to Joe Rogan, but, like, he'll talk, too, about, like, how his opinions have changed over time and... And that's why I think comedians are really interesting because they're always thinking about stuff. They're mm-hmm. always thinking about life. And you kind of like Bill Burr talks about it quite a bit about how he's sort of his mindset's changed on a lot of things. A lot of it's religion and it's maybe not the most inspiring change that anyone's ever gone through, but I can appreciate the, the path that his brain went through. Sure. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, I've thought about, you know, someone's life they want to find purpose in life but i don't think that's what life is about i don't think it's about finding purpose i think life is about finding 
repurpose. Hmm. Because every like every purpose I've ever gone for has been smashed. <laughs> like every, <laughs> it's not I am I am repurposing way more than I'm finding purpose. Like the only the only reason to have a plan in life is it so you will have pieces to glue back together. Hmm. That is the only that is the only advantage of having a plan. Have a plan, realize the only th- what you basically did was you made something so that it would break so that you have pieces to put something else together. Like I want a pot. Sweet. Guess what? Someone's going to throw it on the ground and now you're going to have pieces of a pot and then you're going to have to figure out what you want to make. You can try to make another pot if that's what you really want or you can try if the pieces are break in a different way and you combine them with other things that are broken, you can come up with something else that's cool. But like looking back at my life, it's not, it's not, it's it's never the pot, man. It's working the pieces of the pot. And if you're willing to put the pieces back together, then you might end up with something that's cool. Like you said, I think you do. I think, I mean, looking at a lot of what I've done is just, I don't know my expect, maybe it's, maybe it's me being a little too jaded or whatever, but it's, Maybe maybe it's just experience. Maybe that's what you get to when you live long enough and you fail enough times. Um, well, some people get some people get lucky. Sure. Yep. I think a lot of the very successful people in this world were insanely resilient. They worked really really hard. They didn't give up, and they got lucky too. There's a lot. Well, of so I think involved. that's it. I think that I think the idea is, and again, people have different mindsets on this. But any real big success is a confluence of a lot of things that I think someone could explain as luck. Um, And whether that happens right away or whether that happens 20 years in is just just how dogged you are. Right. So there's some people that, and this is the weird part, there's some people that get famous and get really successful because that confluence happened right away. Had it not happened right away, I don't think th- and there's a subsection of these people that aren't built from the right, aren't cut from the right cloth to have endured to get that. Hmm. Right? And so you see these people that are really successful and you're like, yeah, but this guy's not like super dogged and hardworking and, and um, resilient and resourceful. Yeah, but he just, the confluence happened super early on before he really had to get tested. And he right. wouldn't have survived. Some people, it happens early on, and they still would have. They would have gotten. It was only a matter of time. Mm-hmm. And there's some people that takes 20 years and they get it, somewhere in the 20 years, right? And then there's people that give up all along the way. But it's hard because you, if you just look at the people that have made it, and you don't see when or how long it took them to make it there, you're just going to see this weird subsection of people that's like, or cross section of people, that's like. Mm. Those are not the same. There's like Justin Bieber is mixed with, you know, people that have been in the industry for 30 years and barely broke in. Right. Got some random thing popping up on my, let me close my internet here. I'm getting, sorry, I will, uh, some Facebook messages. Okay. I'll cut that out. Yeah. So, that can be, I don't know if that's encouraging or discouraging or what it is. You can be like, well, as long as this, this person made it, as long as I'm dogged enough and stubborn enough, I will get there. Um, I remember that's what uh, Brian Stavely told me. He's the guy that wrote The Last Immortal Bond. The, uh, do you remember that trilogy with they're like flying on the back of Ketrel on the big birds? Vaguely, yeah. Yeah. I do recognize that name. Yeah, what he had like is... the Skull Sworn, and he had um, the end of the first one. They dr- they drunk like they broke the big dragon's egg at the at the very end of the first one, and they had to drink the stuff, and it gave them like super oh, good senses. Yeah. And the guy got blinded. Yeah, yeah. I so anyway, that I wrote him back on that first book before it had taken off. Really, so this book is awesome. I think he had like five hundred, uh, less than five hundred reviews on Goodreads when I emailed him. And then he ended up winning the David Gemmell Award, and he's off and running. Anyway, for like a year or two, we exchanged some pretty lengthy emails. He was really cool. And he actually read some of my first chapter for A Place Among Heroes, the book that I've never published. 
Mm-hmm. He's like, look, you overwrite. He's like, but your writing's good. He's like, it's just a minute. He's like, this depends. Depends how dogged you want to be. He's like, if you want to be mm-hmm. stubborn with it, you'll get there. He's like, if you don't, you won't. He's like, I got plenty of friends that published one book. They didn't want to continue to do it, so they gave up. And so um, that was the question for me. Is like, do you have enough skill that you're now in that group? Because there's some people that can try stuff their entire lives and their skill. Because in that confluence of luck, has to, part of it has to be skill, right? Right. You have, to, you have to be competent in something. And some people just don't have that bit. They've got mm-hmm. everything else, but they don't have that, they don't have that competence. So I just kind of well, knew I'm competent enough, and I'm competent in different ways from other authors. A lot of right. introverts... A lot of people that aren't willing to be goofy online and do voices and do presentations. And I was like, I've got, not that there aren't people out there like me, but like, I think I got something different to kind of offer. I have a different world experience than a lot of authors for sure. Uh, in, in especially in my genre in middle grade. Um, and I knew I was, I was stubborn enough and passionate enough with it to stick with it. So I was like, all right, it's a matter of time. Well, and I, uh, there's a podcast I like to listen to called Akimbo. It's, Seth Godin's podcast. Um, Akimbo Slice? Oh, no. <laughs> Akimbo Slice. That's awesome. Was a fighting one? Exactly. <laughs> and he talked about being picked. And he says a lot of what makes the difference between people who are wildly successful and people who are not is the luck of being picked. And, you know, nowadays, if you're picked by Netflix or you're picked by, right. you know, Joe Rogan or whatever, you can, you can become – wildly successful but if you're not busy about the business of your thing you'll never then you're not gonna you're not gonna be available to be picked right that's the big thing that was like i need to quit because i just don't i'm not present enough right i'm not in the i'm not the the waitress at la trying to get it right you don't the people that go there the people that sacrifice everything because sometimes i'm like that's the best we got as a society it's like no that's the best we got of people who are willing to sacrifice everything to do that thing that's, you know, because a lot of people that maybe were more talented aren't willing to go schlep yeah. for all those years and sacrifice everything to go do that. They're like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to go be a, you know, something else, an engineer or an auditor or architect or nurse or something else. They're not going to go. And I'm glad we have a lot right. of different people with different um, ways they contribute to society, but. Yeah, so that's, I wanted to, you know, we talk about you just throw things against the wall as much as you can until they stick eventually. But one of the creative guys that I was, I can't remember the book. I can't remember the podcast he was on either. Uh, He was on The Art of Manliness, I think, this one guy. He talked about, like, the four different kind of people, the creative, uh, super, super, uh, you may have even sent me the link. Um Super successful remember, creative people have, and one of them was a yeah. prominent promoter. I talked to Greg Olson about it. And you need a prominent promoter. You need someone that will lend them, lend you their, um, their audience, mm. their credibility, as you're starting out. Some guy go like, mm, he's he's legit. Everyone look at him. And Suzanne Collins is the perfect example. Like yeah, Stephanie Meyer, she's done. Everyone's done. Reading, I'm reading her game or Twilight. It's like, all right, what do we read next? And she just goes, oh, I'm reading Hunger Games. Forty million people <laughs> to send, you know, like a, just a gift. You get one person saying one thing, and you're a millionaire. Now again, mm-hmm. you've got to be competent. You have to have a product out there that impressed the person that's your prominent promoter. So you've got to put forth, you know, good things. Yeah, I was just thinking like. You know, Stephanie Meyer's audience could have read The Hunger Games and been like, oh, this is like Twilight. This sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or they could have been like, this is super violent and it's not, you know, two lovey yeah, dovey people. Not what we're looking for. Not sparkling vampires. No. That ain't no sparkling vampires. <laughs> but that's, that just takes one or two people. That's what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for a prominent promoter. I just got to do enough stuff and be around the right people enough right. that they start to reckon. And I'm not like, I don't want to trick anybody. I don't want anyone to be like, yeah, all right, I'll do your favor. It really sucks, but I'll tell everyone it's good. I don't want that because I don't think it'll stand. It won't last. 
No, you want somebody who really thinks it's good. Right. But I think my stuff's good enough to be liked. Yeah. If it wasn't, I probably wouldn't have quit. Part of the timing, too, and everything, because, you know, I didn't quit. Dad died in October. I didn't quit until August. It was 10 months. Part of it was the reception of the book. Now, I didn't, it's not like it caught wildfire and swept the country in some huge craze of the Techno Wizard, but I got enough feedback from enough people that didn't owe me feedback. And I was like, all right. Yeah, that's an that's an important detail. People are unsolicited giving rave reviews or positive reviews. Yep. And that's a good sign. Yeah, cuz you can you can fit yourself in a nice little echo chamber pretty easy. Mhm. Yeah, just watch an episode of American Idol. Yeah, watch no a bunch kidding. Of people come up there and you know, whose family members have told them they're good at singing, and then Simon Cowell takes a dump in their face, and they, it's the first time they've gotten negative I know. criticism. Yeah, it's tough. It's what's, what's also tough, too, I want to touch on is, so now that my kids are getting older, so a lot of my past failures in high school and stuff, I just, you know, you get over it, you bury it, you move on. Um, but now my kids are starting to go through some of the same things, and so you start to dig up some of those old emotions you haven't <laughs> thought about in 20 years. So one of them was, I mean, sports is one. Right. Although we had really successful teams, right? Like I was talking to Abby. So she's, I've traveled probably over, probably close to a thousand miles going between Bozeman and Helena and everywhere going to her soccer games and her team just gets destroyed. I have probably yeah. watched her team get outscored 40 to two. <laughs> it's so painful. I finally know what it's like to be a parent of a Payson football player. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, it's so painful. And I don't even like soccer. I'm there to support my daughter. And I like it when my kids are scoring and whatever sport they're playing. They could be curling as long as they're doing well. It's kind of fun to watch. But like to watch them lose is tough. And it's yeah. tough on me and it's tough on her. And, you know, anyway, I was driving back. I was like, you know, Abby, between 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade football, I lost five games. <laughs> we were undefeated 7th and 8th grade. We lost one in ninth grade, undefeated 10th and 11th, lost four our senior year. Yeah. So I was like, up to my senior year last, I lost one game. One game. You know? So anyway, we, that wasn't the big, I mean, our trial with sports was getting injured and being recognized and whatever else. And not being naturally super gifted. Um, and not being as large as our eldest brother. And not being, I, I tell the story probably, hopefully one day Coach Van Orden will listen to this podcast. I don't know why he ever would. I tell this story probably once a month because I'll talk about my family. They'll see pictures of Paul and I'll be like, yep, my brothers are six foot four, six two, six foot. I'm five ten, right? And last in the low. And I said, they're all last in line. All played football. And they're like, oh, yeah, oh, that must have been different. And I was like, yep. First thing Coach V said to me, sophomore year, I show up to the football field. Thayer, what happened to you? Your brothers were huge. <laughs> I tell this story all the time. I was like, yeah, that's just how it was. Anyway, so the thing that the thing that really kicked us off wasn't sports; it was student government. So Abby wanted, really wanted, bad to go run for student council. So she's in middle grade. She's in middle grade. She's in middle school now, and she did awesome. Like the morning announcements for her elementary school, which was like exactly what I did in high school, right? She mm-hmm. loved doing videos. She edits her own videos. She edits all of Owen's videos. And anyway, she's perfect for it. Super passionate. Way extroverted. Really funny. And they had to put together this like sheet to said why they should be on student council. And her and our next door neighbor, they worked on it for like four hours a couple Sundays ago. And I helped the next door neighbor because her dad's not around. And mm. so I helped her with her stuff, helped Abby with it. They had very similar sheets, right? They had very similar. They were both Iron Eagles in elementary school to show that they like, had to do all these things. You got, got to be an Iron Eagle and like had to do service and had to get, had to get good grades Anyway, yeah. so they wrote them. They wrote them in their own words. I kind of edited them, cleaned them up. Our next door neighbor got it. Abby didn't. No, oh, no. And oh, Abby was boy. talking about it for a, like a week, like leading up to it. Like, Dad, I think it's today. We're gonna find out. And I just, I kept because I, anytime it came down to a vote, I lost. However yeah. popular and likable I think I am, whenever people decide between me and someone else, it is always someone else like i learned that again and again and again i have yeah um 
anyway, so uh, so Abby comes home. Joel's like, yeah, Abby didn't Abby didn't get it. And I was like, God oh, dang it. I was like, because I was prepping her the week before, like, Abby, it's good to be excited about stuff, and I think you'll do a really good job, but just, you know, try, try to temper her expectations a bit. Right. And sure enough, she didn't get in. And she's like, Dad, did you? how did you get in student government? I was like, well, I ran every single time. I lost every single time. And then the people who were in student government picked me to help out, and then I carved out probably a bigger responsibility than people typically would just because I was passionate about it, and that's how I contributed. Um, but I was like, I lost. Couldn't you just take the, couldn't you like take a class or something? Because I, I didn't run for any student government positions. But yeah, then we were spirit I was, representative. I was or spirit, yes, Northwest spirit representative or whatever, and I ended up doing way more work than most of the elected officials in the student government. Exactly, which is what I did. So I, I need to, I actually have never talked to you about this. I want to talk to you about this. So when I ran for student body body president and lost, so I remember this vividly, and I actually I'm gonna, so I'm gonna talk to Bruce Pitcher in a couple of weeks. I gotta call him, and I want to oh, talk yeah. to him about the, we got I've got some funny, funny stories about Bruce, obviously. Anyway, uh, we all went. It was at a dance where we announced who was gonna be student body president, who all the elected people, the the winners, right? So we got we went back into that back room where we did like some morning announcements and stuff. You mm-hmm. guys were all there because you're the great older. And Gleason was, Miss Gleason was reading through all the stuff. And then it got to me and I was like, I was so confident. Like I thought I had put on such a cool campaign. And anyway, obviously no secret here. I lost and I was so mad. So I just like, I just left. I just started walking home. It was dark and I started walking home. And then you and Mars came and pulled up in the blazer. You're like, dude, Mike. You got to come back, man. And I just remember saying, like, I said, screw it, man. If they don't want me in, fine. They can hmm. they can deal with it themselves. I'm not going to be part of student government. I was obviously pretty bitter. I, and I put myself out there quite a bit with my campaign yeah. and everything. And um, and so I was like, no, nope, screw it. If, you know, they will be out of, I said, I would have contributed a lot. I have a lot of ideas and obviously a lot of passion for this stuff. But... You know, school doesn't want me in there. I don't want to be in there. And you guys mm-hmm. were like, dude, come on, man. Uh, and then you said, it was the closest race ever. You only lost by, we're not supposed to tell you this, man, but you only lost by 10 votes. And I was like, <laughs> I am positive you guys just made that up to get me in the car. <laughs> I have no memory of this. What? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I remember this. <laughs> I'm so glad that uh, it affected us both the same. <laughs> um, you don't even remember it, but yeah. I remember thinking oh, forever, like, yeah, dude, I lost by 10 votes. And then, like, I think it wasn't until, like, after I graduated, I was like, I'm pretty sure they just made that up. I am positive. Because, <laughs> yeah, then we had the other election, and I don't think they shared the, like, we didn't see the numbers when at the end of our senior year for the next junior class. What's funny about it, like, there's, there are things, there are a lot of things about high school. Like, you, you just mentioned all the games you won. I could not, if you held a gun to my head, I could not tell you how many games we won or lost are in any of the years I played football. I just don't have, I, don't I, I feel about that a little bit too. I wish I would have kept a journal after every football game. Yeah. I got this many catches, this many yards, this many touchdowns, because you remember things once you write them down. I'll go back and read my journal and be like, oh my gosh, I totally remember that. Like, I read this. And I have such, like, the accounts I keep in my journal are hilarious because it's just, like, the most random stuff I write down. But one of them is, like, Brady Phillips got in a fight at some dance, you know? And I'll read it back. I'll be like, oh, my gosh, I totally remember this. But I never would have just plucked it from the memory banks. Right. And I had the same I, – I kept the journal, too. I had the exact same experience. I, I took my journal to a party once, like, with old friends and stuff and was reading entries from the <laughs> from so my awesome. journal. They were dying. So much fun. But, yeah, so I – Um, and then I told, actually, I told you guys, I said, look, I'll be on student government as long as I have 100% control over the videos. And then you went back to Gleason and I literally did. She didn't like, I would come up with a video and I'd play it for the whole school and she didn't even check it. Yeah. I did. There's no way they would do that nowadays. No way. We played, we played videos for the entire school at assemblies that no one ever saw before they didn't get past production. So awesome. So anyway, I had a great time, and Abby's like, so how'd you get into student government, blah, you know, and I'm just like, ah, oh, kid, 
I was like, look, I don't know how to run a successful campaign. I thought I was a likable guy and funny and people knew me and I lost every single race I tried. So it's like, I, I don't know what to tell you other than try hard, be passionate, be kind, you know, reach out to people and hopefully you have friends that vote. Because <laughs> mine, because mine didn't. I talked to all my buddies. Like, dude, you guys go vote? Ah, nah, man. Have it during lunch. I can go vote during lunch. Ah, I see how this is gonna go. That's that's the problem. It's not that you didn't have a lot of people who would love to have seen you in there. It's that your friends. I mean, whatever. Were lazy I, pieces of garbage. I don't know. I, I just. I mean, I. It was a good lesson to learn. I remember when I lost. Bring this back to dad. I remember when I lost my. Another sophomore, junior year. And I was just super embarrassed because, again, other people that run don't put themselves out there as much as I did. Right. Um, part of it was probably because I had a big, big ego, and that's fine. They get chopped down every once in a while. Um, but I really put myself out there, like made it very visible what I was doing. And anyway, I remember uh, I was in the utility room, and I was kind of getting dressed for the day and just like wore my hat super low so I wouldn't even you know, make eye contact. And Dad went out there, and he goes, look, son, I know it hurts. In fact, his exact words were, uh, he said, I know it hurts like hell. Because he would rarely ever use that in that instance. Like if he missed a fish, he would say hell. But he would yeah. never like use it in that. And he's like, I know it hurts like hell, but you just got to get out there. And that was the first time he told me, lay me down to bleed a while, but rise and fight again. And which has just become a motto for my entire life. And, um, and, uh, yeah, so I went to school. Obviously, I was pretty bitter for a while, and then I got over it. But, um, but yeah, I it stinks because I know that's coming for a lot of kids, right? Like, right. my football career in the end was a huge disappointment. Got injured my junior year and senior year. Um, started every game my entire life, and the last last game we ever played, coach benched me because mm. he wanted to change the defense up because Canyon or Mount Crest was a you know running a different offense, and we. <clears throat> They lit us up for more points than I'd ever had scored on me in my entire life. Yeah. Um, so I sat most of my last game, which was just like, you know, devastating, mostly scarring. I still, I mean, I still have weird dreams about it. I'm 34, mm. you know, <laughs> and we all have weird football dreams. Um, I always show up with like, without my cleats. Yeah. You don't have some piece of your equipment and everyone's mm -hmm. got it and you don't, and you're scrambling for it. Mine are always like the games are in our backyard. Or like they're always in weird places, and I just and can't ever. A lot make of mine work. are like, Coach, I'm a middle aged man. Can I still play? Yeah, and he's the like, same way. Yeah, dude. <laughs> like some weird loophole. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm actually feeling pretty good. Um, but you know, I don't know. I just, it's weird now that my kids are in a, are at an age where they can have failure like that. Yeah. I mean, your Disappointment. disappointments. You're constantly trying to tell your kids like to suck it up when they're little. Because they're crying over stupid stuff, you mm -hmm. know? Like, for heaven's sakes, quit your whining about whatever. And then when they get older and they get into stuff and they get, you know, they work hard of their own free will and choice and they put a lot of passion into stuff and then they fail, you're like, ah, yeah, I remember how that was. Yeah. And so you're constantly like, part of it's you're sharing advice because you've been there and you failed. And I've, my list of things I've been passionate about and failed is very, very long. Um, but in some respects, I mean, I could just go walk right up to Abby and be like, Abby, I know exactly how you feel. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and if that's all you do, that's fine. You yeah. Know, that's, that's validating her feelings is, is important. She feels like she has at least somebody out there who knows what she's going through. Yeah, I just think life is not about – like I think you measure somebody not by what they succeed in, but by how many times they sort of overcome failure. Because mm. like how many times can you repurpose yourself? How many times can you rebuild yourself? Like it's not nearly – part of it is being tough, being able to take damage and absorb damage. And part of that is being able to – it's like the T-1000 thing. Like yeah. some of it's like not being melted down, but another part of it is being to just reform yourself in mm -hmm. some way once you get melted because you're going to get scorched, man. There's no ways. Of... And Abby's big thing now is all of her friends have cell phones. 
She does not have a phone. By the way, anyone that listens to this, I, and you give your 10-year-old or 9-year-old a smartphone, oh, I would to love to, to have a conversation with you. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's come on the podcast and let's have a conversation. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Like, I don't know. Anyway, the vast majority of her friends have phones, smartphones. Right. She's 11. She's 11. Most of her friends don't have training bras, and they have smartphones. Like, right. give me a break, parents. Like, I am not the gr- greatest parent on earth. I have plenty of flaws, but that is not one of them. Mm-hmm. Like, how naive of a human being do you have to be? I don't know, man. It's caught up in the... Who are you competing with? Like, your kid? You're going to, like, cave to your kid? Like, Abby sees it now. It was the first year, it was like, Dad, when am I going to get a phone? When am I going to get a phone? And now it's like, yeah, I see it, Dad. She doesn't even, I mean, she, it just all, all requests for a phone have stopped. Cause what she, does she, she see? She sees her friends abs- totally absorbed into their phone. Mm-hmm. Like, I heard her say, because she has the iPad, right? We have a family iPad. She can text her friends from the iPad. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I have complete control over that. There's a password on it. I can look at what's being sent to her. Um, she only has it in the house. She doesn't have it, you know, other places. I know exactly right. what apps are on there. And so, um, and so she sees her friends, like she goes over to her friend's house and the mom's like, Abby, how does your dad keep you off your phone? Because Abby's like, I go over to this house and everyone's just on their phone. And Abby's like, uh, I don't have a phone. And I'm not like, this is not some new age, like, new way of thinking parents let's start an assembly and let's talk about how we get away from like this should just be common sense this is not a new way of thinking right this is just like i don't know my mind is boggled by this and so then she'll see like her friends that just all they do is text and then she'll kind of be like dad all the friends are texting i'm being left out of these conversations and i was like well you know all those conversations you really need to be a part of is there any way that you can you know still chime in she's like but they don't invite me to stuff and so she's she's kind of in the middle. She's friends with the popular girls, but then she's also friends with kind of some other people as well. And she's got this this other group of of Mormon friends too. They're just awesome, mm-hmm. and they're a lot more like her as far as having access to some of this stuff. And I kind of see her gravitating towards there. Um, but it's a tough time for her, man. She really is yeah. in middle school. I've never, you know, I've been eleven, but I haven't been eleven year old girl in two thousand eighteen. Yeah. And it's tough. And so my heart just kind of goes out to her a little bit. But I was like, I'm not going to get you a phone. I'm just, and, but she sees it. Like, I'm, I'll probably get her a flip phone when she's like 14. Mm-hmm. She can text. She can call me. If she's out with her friends, I kind of know where she's at. Um, but it's like, I know what the parents are going to say. Like, oh, I don't even know where they're at. Or, you know, I'm working. It's like, how many places is your 11-year-old? <laughs> you don't actually know exactly where they are. Like, if anything, that was how we used to live. Right. We used to just like, bye mom, go into whatever, and you just take off on your bike and you'd be gone. I feel like I grew up in the 30s compared <laughs> to now. You know? And now back then you would be like, where the heck is Mike? You wouldn't even know. Now it's like, right. I know exactly where Abby is at all times. I know exactly yeah, where my daughter is. You to call around to different friends' houses. Hey, yeah. is my son over there? Yep. And we survived. But it's like, yeah, I had the whole... What a pathetic excuse to give your kid unfettered access to the world mm-hmm. because you want to know where they're at. Have them wear a a watch or a flip phone or something. <laughs> Low jack them with a GPS. <laughs> yeah, so I just, that's another, yeah. I just, I don't understand that one at all. I don't get it. I, In fact, I told Abby, I said, if you can give me one good reason why you need a smartphone, I will buy you one tomorrow. <laughs> she couldn't come up with a good reason. She had to admit it. Well, I want to call. I'll get you a flip phone. Well, you know, you need to know where I'm at. I know where you're at. I, I solved that through parenting. <laughs> you talk about the Swiss cheese model. How can yeah. something go bad to your kid and all the different kind of controls? The last thing is a smartphone. There's all these other ways you need to address that way up front. Mm-hmm. You need to in, you're engineering how you raise your kid administrative controls, what you allow them to do in your rules. Like, there are so many things you do before you just 
throw a phone at them. That's the equivalent of going, well, I know this refinery's on fire, so suit up in that bunker gear and get in there. <laughs> You're just, that is the last line of defense, man. And there's like a thousand other, anyway, that's a soapbox I didn't expect to get on, but like, I don't get it. I really, seriously, if you have, if your kid's 10, 11, 12, and you gave them a smartphone and you think you've got it figured, give me a call. I would love that conversation. Yeah. Number one, you're just making it harder for me to raise my daughter. <laughs> is what you're doing <laughs> in the way that I want to raise her. So everyone adapt to my parenting style right now. I don't know. We've had to have this conversation, not this conversation, but a conversation similar to it about Fortnite. Oh. Because my oldest was way into... Get, like getting the skins yeah. he would use the money that he earns from doing work to buy these skins and then there was some glitch and one of them disappeared from his item locker or whatever and he would he melted down he was like he's he still won't you texted them and and you emailed them and they won't they won't put it back in there why not they're so mean they're just so greedy and selfish dude <laughs> sorry yes you must learn these lessons when you're young Mm -hmm. corporate greed and Fortnite skins. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a different time to raise kids than it was when we were kids. I get like, society has moved so fast. So fast. Things have changed so much. I do. I sometimes look back. What's funny is I was talking to Eric about this. We were talking about social media and how I should engage on social media. And, and he's like, we missed that growing up with social media by like three years. Yeah. And he's like, I feel like I'm a hundred. Because his wife's five years younger than him, and she just talks through social media much better. Like, they're so much better on, like, Instagram stories and Facebook stories. Like, anyone that talks to anybody on social media that's 35 years and above, it's Facebook. 35 years and below, it's Instagram. And mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, teenagers are probably doing Snapchat and Musical.ly and other stuff, too. But, like, it's true. And I didn't ever have to communicate through social media. Like, I came back from a mission. I got married right away. Right. So I wasn't like hooking up with girls or meeting new groups of friends. And so I like, my life was like set. I hardly even like got on Facebook and stuff. What was mm -hmm. the reason? You know, and I just, I seriously feel like, so I, I missed it by whatever. And I just, I seriously, sometimes I feel like I am a hundred years old. I'm like the old grandpa. You got them Insta stories? What you got there? Yeah, we're in kind of a weird position where we're, we're young enough to have been, you know, young people, te older teenagers, when when cell phones were becoming a thing, right? Uh, but also old enough to have grown up in a time when we didn't have personal computers. I tell people I have done book reports through both Encyclopedia, Britannica's, and Google. Yeah. I'm one of the very few our generation. There's probably like a 15 year span of people that have done both. Yeah, man. In I the remember. history of the world, we are that one bridging <clears throat> generation between the old age and the new age. Hmm. It's a weird thing. But yeah, man, I mean, I don't want to stay up too late here, but uh, yeah, it's a time where I'm going to start, I'm going to start breaking down, hopefully a lot of barriers and reinvent myself in a lot of, a lot of different ways. I'm very interested on pulling a lot of my biases. And again, I'm not talking about biases as in like, maybe some of them are like racism, sexism, whatever else. But a lot of it's like you said, a fear of failure, a fear of whatever else, whatever barriers do I have? Mm -hmm. that are up there put it all on the table man and then just reevaluate it and if it you know if i need to shake some things around and restructure some narratives i'm very willing to do that it's definitely a different mindset it's a mindset where you have to be mindful and thoughtful about your own internal reactions to things so as soon as you feel discomfort instead of reacting to that discomfort reflexively it's an opportunity to ask yourself okay i'm feeling discomfort right now why right yeah and that's do good. i need to and if if the why is i don't know then push forward and see what happens see what you learn but if the why is well i really don't want to x y and z you're avoiding something and maybe ask yourself why again why am i avoiding that why am i avoiding that pain hmm very cool all right man i will let you go yeah Gracias, it's Captain and Doctor. Been a pleasure. All right, man. 
So there you go. That's the episode. Again, I thought it was pretty interesting. I am at a crossroads right now, uh, a time of reinventing myself, and I am very willing to kind of throw it all on the table, all my different habits and, and paradigms and biases and everything else. Um, at the very least, just to take inventory and to try to understand myself better and where I might be able to tweak kind of who I am and and my belief system a little bit. Um, to try to kick my life off into into the next phase. I really do feel like uh, just a chapter closed in my life uh, a year ago when my father passed away. And I'm very excited to literally and figuratively write the next chapters uh, in my life. And so uh, it's an exciting time for me. It's it's I get very excited when I look at that and I just think, you know, all the things that didn't go or haven't gone exactly how I want them to go, I totally am in the driver's seat to change those things. Now, I'm at the mercy of a lot of things, uh, obviously, but there's a lot of things that I can control, a lot of, thing, a lot of things from a mindset perspective, um, from a mindfulness perspective. Um, and it's, it's a very empowering um, notion, idea, to realize how much actually is in my control and how much I do control with my mind. And if you're willing to sort of recontextualize some things, how much opportunity that opens up for you. So I'll be exploring a lot of this stuff more as we go in different episodes. I've got some really interesting episodes coming up. Um, again, I, I hinted at one during this conversation talking to Dr. Michael Hill about intermittent fasting and, and some of the uh, the preconceived barriers I'd put up around that, around, around dieting and, and kind of pushing your body to the limits. Um, I also talked to Dave Doring. He is at the very heart of the science fiction fantasy scene in in Utah. In fact, his interview was the very first interview I did way back in July, and I've kind of just been waiting for the right moment to air it, and it, it talks about why are there so many dadgum successful science fiction and fantasy authors in Utah, and I kind of get to the bottom of that. It's It all happens around a, a culture uh, that Dave and a couple other people helped create way back in the 80s, and... Um, Anyway, again, a really interesting conversation with him. So, until then, please respond to the call as I call to all nerds, whatever your nerdery might be. Thank you, and until next week, ciao. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Calling All Nerds. To find out more about Mike, his novels, blog posts, videos, and everything else interesting, go to mike-thayer.com.